there was any uh, questions you have about what about thinking of doing a master's or if you've already signed up and you want to know a little bit more before you make a final decision. A few introductions before we, we get started. I'm Sarah Atkinson. I'm the Director of Postgraduate Studies in the department. Um, we have with us, we have Isabella Bovolo, who'll give us a wave. Isabella is the Director of the Master's Programme in Risk. Uh, we have Marcus Power. Give us a wave, Marcus. Hi, everyone. And Marcus is, <laughs> is the Director of the MA in Research Methods in the department. Um, we have Dave Roberts. Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Dave is the um, Deputy Director of, of Research Studies, but also very knowledgeable about the Masters by Research programme. Now, I'm going to share my screen with you so that I've got a few slides just to introduce things. We've also, can I just say, we've also got um, Emily West here representing Sorry. Um, the <laughs> MSc course in risk and also Lucy Charlesworth representing the MA course. OK, so any <laughs> questions if, that you might have about the student experience, uh, we can we can get Emily and Lucy to tell you all about that. Just a, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording the session. We, we hope to make that available on the department website in future. We ask everyone to mute your microphone during the webinar. Uh, you'll probably be quite familiar with this by now. Obviously, if it's not muted, there can be background noise and so forth. We haven't automatically muted everybody because it may be that you know, there's not a huge number of you. You might want to talk and chat a bit more informally. At the moment, though, we're saying if you've got questions as we go along, do log them through the chat function. Uh, that's this little yellow circle here is where you find the chat function. Uh, if for any reason you're having trouble with the sound um, or we're talking too fast uh, or you can't understand our various accents or whatever, you can click on the three dots here and I believe uh, an option for to get live sit captions come up. So you can try that and see if the live captions can translate us better if there's a problem. Don't know, I've done the who's who. So just a little bit about the department for those who, who are, are new to us. Uh, it's a very big department. We're probably the biggest um, geography department in the United Kingdom. We've got over 60 members of academic staff. We've got a huge, um, a huge number of, of administrative, technical, uh, all kinds of support for our students and staff, which does make the running of things very efficient in the department. And perhaps more importantly, we've got a large community of uh, postgraduates doing masters and, and research degrees and postdoctoral early career researchers who are taking that forward into a bit more research of their own or working on funded projects. We also have a very, very large body of undergraduates who you may have uh, various interactions with as a postgraduate. So we run three kinds of um, master's programmes, uh, as well as our doctoral three year programme. I've put the doctoral programme up here just because some of you may have a longer term view of thinking about of, of heading that way. But our master's uh, programme itself involves uh, the master's, which can be an MA or an MSc programme in risk that runs for a year. We have a master's in what we call the research methods uh, with a specialisation in geography. And this is a, a programme that is designed to train people in research approaches, often with a view to going on to do a a doctoral research degree afterwards. And we also have a one year master's by research um, where you do a project of your own, perhaps in collaboration with a member of staff. So it's a bit like doing a, a sort of bigger dissertation. Uh, for you. So, you, so there's not a taught component in that. You, you just sort of get on with it. You can do it full time. You can do it part time. Um, the master's programmes, the taught masters at the moment start in October, uh, the research masters you can start at other times of year, particularly January, we sometimes have people starting. Just to remind you, if you if you've 
you may have looked at this already, but just to remind you that the, what this would cost you, uh, the taught master's programmes are um, full time 11,000 if you're uh, a UK or EU at the moment student and international students are coming in at 20,000. Just wanted to flag up here that we, we are offering, the university is offering a, a pretty generous discount at the moment to anyone who is um, a Durham alumni. And I've, I've done the calculation for the home students, but it does apply to the international students as well. So anyone who's done a degree at Durham gets a 25% discount. This is something that's, that's come in relatively recently. We've been talking about it for some time, mainly because Durham is a, a huge exporter of undergraduates onto other people's master's programmes. And we have some very, very good undergraduates. And to be honest, we're just a bit fed up with them going somewhere else. Um, so we're hoping this will uh, attract some of them to stay. There's many, many reasons for going somewhere else, of course, um, including the topic of the of the master's and also going to see somewhere else. But we're hoping that we can perhaps bribe a few, a few more to, to stay with us as well as those that come in. The Masters by Research is a um, is a much cheaper option, mainly because there isn't uh, quite the same amount. There isn't the teaching element in there, though you, it, this doesn't mean to say you're left to your own devices. You do get a supervisor. You do meet with your supervisor regularly. But it is a very sort of um, a very efficient, a very, a very cheap option for a master's degree. What happens if you're at Durham? Uh, we have a lot of research activities. It's a very research strong department. We organise our research around uh, various themes that act sort of like polls that people can, you know, can go to the activities that are organised. So we call these our research clusters. At the moment, uh, we have urban worlds, cultural and economy, politics, state and space, geographies of life on the human side. And then the physical geography, geography side, it's organised around catchments and rivers, hazards and surface change, ice sheets and sea level. These shift from time to time, depending on how people come, people go, research interests change. We have a, a sort of rethink every so often about how we organise this. Um, they run activities, they run uh, workshops, um, informal brainstorming groups, and they're very open to postgrads and they're very open for postgrads to propose sessions and organise sessions and there's a wee bit of funding attached to that. We're affiliated to a large number of research centres and units in the university. They're often, these are often more interdisciplinary uh, research centres that bring various ideas together uh, and geographers of course like that because it's quite an interdisciplinary subject in itself. So we have the Institute for Hazard and Risk Research, which is very closely aligned to geography um, and the, the Masters in Risk is, is aligned to that institute. We have the Institute of Medical Humanities that geography is also a, a foundational member of. We have an institution of advanced studies that brings visitors in uh, for periods of time from elsewhere. Centre for Social Justice and Community Action that has a very strong participatory research focus that a lot of our students uh, um, are attracted to and find very interesting. Uh, we, we host the International Boundaries Research Unit, which is a, a, a unit that has global reach and, and international recognition for its work. We also host something called NOMIS that, that um, runs a large government database on social and economic um, and labour information. And then we have the Sea Level Research Unit, and the name's on the tin there. And, we, and the new, a new thing in Durham is the Durham Research Methods Centre, where we try to pull together the expertise across the university in, in various and a, a big range of research methods. And certainly anyone on, on the MA Research Methods degree would have some interaction with that. How do we look after you? Um, if you're doing a, a research master's, you'll have two supervisors and you meet with them very regularly uh, to make sure that you have a record of, of what you're doing, the decisions you're making, uh, the, the actions that need to be taken. Uh, and you, it helps you just kind of document what you're doing as you go along. For the uh, taught master's students, obviously, most of the time you're in the first two terms, you're in taught classes with course tutors to support you. And then you have an independent dissertation. And again, um, you'll 
programme di director helps decide that and allocates a supervisor from the uh, from the staff to help support you with that. We're a very well resourced department. Um, Durham's a well resourced university, uh, relatively speaking, overall. We've got we have various resources at people's disposal. Uh, we do have laptops or some laptops available for our, our research students to to borrow. Um, for the taught masters, we have space for you to sort of put stuff and, and, and be able to lock stuff away so you don't have to be carting stuff backwards and forwards all the time. Um, we aren't able at the moment to offer dedicated desk space for our um, master students, but there are spaces that you can use um, in, as a shared resource. For those who are interested in, in GIS and remote sensing, we have a dedicated lab for that kind of work. We have a huge range across the university <coughs> of various software programmes, and of course people can flag and request um, other programmes that, that come on the market that you might argue are needed. We've got a huge amount of equipment and facilities, as you might expect. Um, we do a lot of field work. Uh, we've got a lot of software. We've got labs, all kinds of um, data recording equipment like cameras and digital recorders and so forth. And again, um, we can add to that if, if something crops up that somebody needs. There is um, free printing uh, for, for postgrads at the moment. Um, only black and white, I'm afraid, but it is it is that is quite a resource for you. And for those who maybe feel a little unsure of their skills, either language skills or writing skills, uh, we have a number of centres that provide training courses in all kinds of academic skills, but including including writing and language. Um, for those that might think of doing a research degree, there is there are opportunities to do a bit of teaching. I think the master's students don't do this so much, mainly because it's it's a pretty intense year doing a taught master's course. Um, but there may be opportunities to go on field trips uh, or to do a little bit of, of um, mentoring or tutoring of some of the undergraduates, which is a great thing to have to put on your CV. The postgrad community is, is, is absolutely great. I've been the, the director of postgrad studies for a year now, and they're uh, they have, they're very good at getting together and organising and supporting one another in, in all kinds of ways. It's a very large community, so there's subgroups within that. Um, we as staff obviously want to want to help the communities run their activities and support whatever it is they're doing. Um, we very much, you know, espouse uh, uh, respect and we don't tolerate any disrespect to people on any uh, of a range of characteristics. Um, and there's, as I've already said, there's a lot of activities where people come together, where people come to chat, to discuss more formal spaces, more informal spaces. And we're very, very keen that we all uh, are able to exchange our ideas, uh, exchange practical skills and learn from one another. And our, our postgrads are hugely important in this. Some of the things that the postgrads get up to, um, they have had a, 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 a get together. Um, every other Friday where they, they order pizza, the department's been footing the bill. That That's going to be on hold for a little while at the moment under current circumstances, but I'm sure we'll be thinking of other ways of, of replicating that social space. We have a range of conferences and seminars that postgrads present at or attend, um, and they themselves ask for certain seminars, whether it's skills building or, or conceptual development. So it's a buzzing space to be. Obviously, we're in a very, really rather odd time at the moment, and I'm sure one of the things you really want to know is what on earth is going to happen in October. Um, and short of saying, well, we're not entirely sure, um, the, the university has uh, obviously planned ahead and made a few decisions. Our current plan is that we, we do hope that we will be open. We are planning to be open in October in, in some form. This will probably be a slightly uh, reduced form. So we will have students in Durham. We would we will hope to welcome you to Durham. That said, social distancing will still be in place, almost certainly. Um, some of the activities are not uh, practical. And of course, our primary concern is that everybody is safe if they come to us at Durham. So large classes, uh, particularly lectures, um, that's particularly true of undergraduate lectures, will be online. 
Um, we are hoping that smaller groups, uh, small, if there's only small numbers on a course or the small group uh, tutorials and seminars, we will teach face to face. So it's likely to be a bit of a hybrid model. Interestingly, what we have found is that there, you know, there are, of course, a number of advantages to online lectures as well as some of the disadvantages. So we have had quite positive feedback from students from the first branch of, branch of things that we've done online. Uh, and there are all kinds of advantages. Some people who don't like talking in lectures feel much more comfortable um, voicing their opinions and asking questions in the chat function, for example. So um, there's, there's, you know, there's wins and, and losses with that one. But that's where we're at with our plans for October at the moment. Are there any just sort of general questions anybody has at the moment? What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the research masters first, then the masters uh, for research methods, and then the masters in risk, which is our, our bigger, biggest programme. Are we, are we seeing anything? I haven't got the chat function up. Anyone see this? Any queries? No, there's nothing at the moment. Great, OK, so that's just a general background. I'll push on then, just introduce you briefly to the, the Masters by Research. There's one question. Uh, it is yes, a research so degree. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Can you read it out? Uh, it's from um, Ludi. Uh, I'd like to ask about the start of the um, MSc in risk. I heard that some programmes of business plan to start in January. Yeah. I'm just worried yeah. about the epidemic in the UK. So what's the yeah. plan for the start of risk, Isabella? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, so we do plan to be online um, in if if basically if you can't turn up. So the idea is that um, that we will, as Sarah says, uh, plan to open as much as possible uh, with remote lectures, etc. But the start date is, is still going to be October. There's no January start date. But if you can't turn up, if you um, for some reason there's uh, borders are shut or um, you know there's visa issues or whatever, then uh, we we hope to maintain a contact with you through uh, an online offering at that time at least uh, until that time when you can actually turn up. So um, so there will be a possibility to do some at least some of the course online, taking uh, you know advantage of the the online lecturing and the shared facility to kind of do uh, group work, just like these kind of lectures here, which are live as well. And I'll go. Through, um, I'll answer some more of those types of questions as I present a little bit more about the risk masters in a little bit. Thanks, Isabel. So this is this is really where we're at overall in Durham. There are variations across departments and across the different needs of, of student bodies. So that, you know, this will will vary according to who it is who signed up for the course and what their needs may be. So as Isabella said, there are some specific considerations uh, that, that we'll come back to a little bit more in detail. Thanks for that. That's an um, important question. OK, so the, the, the research masters, as I say, it is a bit like an extended dissertation. You define something that really fascinates you, that you want to spend a bit more time researching in depth. It may be that you talk to the potential supervisor. You've got a general field that you're interested in um, and you talk together. They may have something they really want somebody to work on um, at the moment. Of course, we have further questions about going and doing field work. So a supervisor may have a body of data that they have a million questions they'd like to ask of that data and, and they'd love to, you know, they're only too happy to have a master's student come and, and work on that and make that available too. So it's really about discussing and sort of negotiating in a way a theme with a potential supervisor. We think of it as a one year, um, a one year degree. You have, you, we do allow up to two years to get the, the, the piece of work in because sometimes People really you know, get stuck in and take longer or, or need to do a little bit of um, work alongside, but don't want to go part time. It's a great it's a great option. Um, it really is. You know, if you've enjoyed doing an undergraduate dissertation, this is a chance to do a bit more of that kind of work, to work independently on something that, that, that really, really grabs you and go into it in, in, in detail and in depth. Um, you obviously develop your research skills. 
um, a whole range of, of, of whether it's number crunching or dealing with um, qualitative data, synthesizing all kinds of information, writing. There's a range of skills that, you know, that even if you don't go into research afterwards, you take as uh, transferable skills to uh, a, another employment space. And it shows employers that you have initiative, that you're able to work independently, you'll be able to deliver a product on time to a high quality and so forth. So there's a huge number of, um, of benefits for you on your CV, as it were, regardless of what you decide to do afterwards. And we have had people go into all kinds of walks of life after having done a, a research master's. And it's, um, you know, and it's, as I said before, it's not very expensive compared to some of the other programmes. Uh, you, you aren't getting the, the direct teaching. It's not a degree that perhaps takes you off into a, um, a slightly different direction in, a, in an efficient way, the way a taught master's does. But it, you know, it does really consolidate a whole load of, of skills and enables you to go into a particular topic and, and become an expert in that topic. So the, in, in the first instance, you could contact myself or, or Dave um, in relation to any queries about this. Here's just a few examples. We have had a lot of MSCs by research. So these are, I think, these latest ones are. We have had human geography as well. I had one a few years ago who, who did something on health and then actually went off to train to be a doctor afterwards. So, um, so he went off in a very different direction. Um, but as you can see, a whole range of, oh, no, there's an identity one there for the Mapuche. But you know, it's it's, probably, it's really it's probably just worth saying, Sarah, that more often than not, um, these dissertations that are done through the M Res route lead to publications. Um, yeah. So yeah. they're often a bespoke piece of work that's at the research frontier, working with staff in the department. Um, they may be an idea that you've come up with independently, or they may be ideas that are linked to ongoing research projects in the department. So, for example, this year uh, I've got a student who's working on um, the history of the Greenland ice sheet uh, in northeast Greenland, working on some ocean cores that were collected a couple of years ago. Uh, and that particular student is now embedded in our, our NERC project. And hopefully that will result in the publication of um, a paper. So they're a really fabulous opportunity to become embedded uh, within the uh, university research infrastructure to get a feel for what research is all about. Um, and potentially, not only could they lead to, you know, new and improved skills and interesting career pathway, they could, God forbid, take you down the route of a PhD if you were mad enough. Um, so that's something to think about. Great. Thanks, Dave. OK, I just thought before I hand over to Isabella, there are a few um, sort of general points that have come up before that we could just sort of um, troubleshoot, as it were, or, or flag before. But um, again, you, know, you may have many, many others. Uh, so the risk master tends to be somewhere between about 20 to 30 people. So it's quite a nice big community. Uh, those doing the masters by research, that, that's very variable. We've got, um, we've got about four this year doing following this kind of degree, um, but they join a much, there's a, a big community of people doing PhDs and so forth. Uh, the MARM tends to be a smaller number because they're often specifically funded to go on to the, 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 the um, PhD programme. So in geography, I think we've got two or three, but they are actually part of a, the MA in research methods is a cross university programme. So actually altogether, there's about 30 or 40 of them. Uh, I, the only funding we have available at the moment for masters is the reduction for the for the Durham alumni. Um, we, we don't have any ready money for any other routes in, but people sometimes do manage to find uh, sponsors uh, independently or, or from their own country. You can apply any time, and we you know if you're interested in coming this October, we still can take um, applications in. And they do have to go be processed through admission. So I think um, probably the end of August is it would it would be very tight to turn it out in time for October, but um, it's not impossible. We do start in October. Um, so I've said by the end of July there, but yes, I think we, we run into August holiday season um, otherwise. So 
sometimes people think, well, you know, why should I do a master? I've already got, very, you know, I've got my good bachelor's degree. Um, you know, that the advantage really of, of adding a master's to your portfolio is that, of course, there are a lot of people coming out of universities with degrees now. Um, it, it really does give an opportunity just to kind of put you a little bit ahead of the pack by showing that you have got some further development of the sorts of skills researching and doing academic work gives you. Um, it's also a, a commitment and an interest uh, in, in a particular area, uh, and it, it does show an, it sort of a certain independence, um, initiative, ability to organise yourself and, and do and deliver on quite complicated tasks. People often ask about part-time options. These these are all possible. We, it, you really need to then discuss with the course director or supervisor how, how you do that and uh, we do have people following the programs part-time but it's obviously a way of spreading the the costs if you need to do a bit of work at the same time so that's the main things in, by way of introduction and uh, introducing the mres options um if there's no particular questions at the moment, which there don't seem to be. I'm going to hand over to Marcus to take us through the uh, the Masters in Research Methods option. Marcus, okay. are you able to share a screen? Yeah, I'll just do that now. Um, Thank you. You'll need to turn your screen off, Sarah. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, I'll try again. Um. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that. So thanks uh, for the introduction, Sarah. So I'm Marcus Power. I'm the Programme Director for the Masters in Research Methods, the MARM programme that uh, Sarah mentioned. And I just wanted to, uh, before I come to sort of say a little bit about the programme, just to say a bit about why, why study geography at Durham, why come to our department, really. Um, I just thought it was worth just underlining how um, fantastic a department it is really in all sorts of different ways. It's one of the best department, uh, geography departments in the world, consistently recognised as such across a, a wide range of criteria. We're as a department currently rank, uh, ranked second in the Guardian University Guide of last year and fourth in the Complete University Guide for 2021 and also the Times, Sunday Times, a good university guide for 2020. And a, a kind of key measure really of the work that we do in the department is uh, the research excellence framework and the, re the recent REF found that we produce the, the, the most world leading research publications and we're also top for overall uh, research power in the discipline uh, nationally. Not just that, but we have, uh, Sarah mentioned this already, I think, um, some really world class facilities and it's just a great place to, to study and to work. It's a really friendly, supportive in environment. Um, we work really, really closely with our postgraduate students and they're a really integral part of what we do as a department, really. So it's just a really nice place to work. It's a great city, a, a great department. And also just to say a little bit about human geography, really. Um, I think I just wanted to underline really just how much of the human geography work that we do in the department is really at the kind, at the kind of cutting edge of the discipline. Um, Sarah's already mentioned the four research clusters that um, shape the human geography work that we do in the department. They are culture and economy, geographies of life, uh, politics, state space and urban worlds. And they're kind of poles, as Sarah mentioned, they're kind of gathering points for people that work on different themes at different times uh, in the department. I think the, the key thing I wanted to, two key things I wanted to, to mention about this really. Firstly, that postgrads are a, a really important part of our research clusters. Um, they're key to the events that we organize, the workshops, the seminars, the reading groups that we do. Um, and all of, our, all, all of those kinds of activities are in, in organized with uh, postgraduates right at the heart of it. Um, but also, you know, I think, what, I think it's fair to say that within each of those four research clusters, we've got people that are setting the agenda globally in terms of research. Um, you know, Dave mentioned earlier work at the sort of research frontier. And I think these four research clusters 
are really good examples of that. We, we, we've got work in all four of them that's right at the cutting edge globally of where human geography is at right now. And you know, we've got, we've got people that are, that are setting the agenda, not just following some of these debates, but actually kind of setting the agenda. Um, so to come to, to say a bit more about the, the, the MARM programme itself, um, <clears throat> I think the, the key point I wanted to get across really is it has kind of two main uh, focal points or, or, or objectives really. Firstly, and, and fundamentally, it tries to provide uh, a broad training in social science research methodology. So it's largely a programme that's focused very much on social science research methods, bringing you up to speed in terms of the variety of different methods that are involved looking at some of the ethical uh, and practical issues around using some of these methods. But secondly, the program is trying to do more than just sort of introduce you to a range of research methods. It's also trying to provide more specific training in some of the approaches and te techniques that we use in human geography. So it will cover things like uh, theoretical or, or philosophical approaches to human geography. Um, it's also important to, 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 to mention that it's an ESRC recognized MA training course. So it's something that, um, that has been developed in conjunction with the UK's Economic and Social Research Council. They regularly uh, review the teaching that we do and approve uh, the program on a sort of rolling basis really. Um, so it's kind of externally recognized by a number of, of, of funding agencies, primarily the ESRC. And in terms of the structure of the of the program. Well, it's composed of six core compulsory modules that all students do. That, they comprise 150 credits of the 180 that you need to do. And then the, the additional 30 uh, credits can be made up from a choice of five optional modules. I'll say a little bit about those modules uh, in a moment. I think another key thing I wanted to get across really is that the hallmark of the teaching that we do on the, the MARM is teaching in small groups. So it's really, really interactive, lots of opportunities for, for participation. And we put a really heavy emphasis on, on students engaging with, with, with the material that we're presenting and on discussing some of those different ideas. Um, in terms of sort of the, the mechanics of, of the teaching program and how it's delivered, it's most of the modules, in fact, all of them really are, de are delivered in terms one and two. And the idea is that by the time you get to about April of, of the academic year, from Easter onwards, um, students then work on a, a dissertation research project of their choosing in, con in conjunction with a, a supervisor. I'll say a bit more about the dissertation in a moment, but here's an overview of the structure. So you can see at the top the core modules that we do. Um, so all students will do these modules. Um, if I can just pick out, say, three of these just to, to just give you a flavour of what we do. Um, using geographical skills and techniques, this is the sort of core of the methods teaching that we do in the department. So it's an introduction really to a whole variety of primarily qualitative but some quantitative research methods as well but we also go beyond looking at those methods we also talk a little bit about uh, issues of research dissemination you know what do we do with uh, research results and outcomes and, and the data that we collect at, at the end of a research project um, <clears throat> so there's a, a an exposure there to a whole variety of different methods and also a sense of sort of what what we do with with data once we've collected it. Um, I mentioned earlier how the, the course is, isn't just about methods, it's also about sort of philosophical and theoretical approaches and that module at the top philosophy and theory uh, is, is a good example of that. So it's focusing on what's happening in contemporary human geography and it introduces a range of philosophical and theoretical approaches and I should say we, we have input on that module from colleagues at, at Newcastle University as well so it's a chance to engage with uh, colleagues uh, in, in the wider northeast region. We have staff and students that contribute to that module from, from Newcastle. But the, the module I wanted to really just pick out in particular was research frontiers in human geography. I think this is just a really good example of what we're trying to do with the MARM. So this is a course that's primarily based around seminars and workshops and we have a, a broad selection of staff that come in each week to introduce something that they're working on sort of right now, you know, you know contemporary cutting edge research that I mentioned earlier. Um, and students are invi invited to review and critique that current research and there's a very you know really productive sort of discussion and dialogue about with the member of staff about their research and the different directions that it can go in but the, the point I'm trying to get across really is that there's lots of opportunities here to be exposed not just to different debates about research methods but to kind of cutting edge work in human geography and I think another sort of real strength of the MARM is as well as that it's not just delivered by geography. So there's an opportunity to, uh, to choose optional modules that are offered by a range of other departments, psychology, anthropology, sociology, 
and the, and the School of Applied Social Sciences are the main departments that we work with. So there's a real sort of interdisciplinary element to the programme as well. It's primarily anchored in geography, but with an opportunity to engage with staff and students in a range of, of other departments. And I have to say our students have found it really useful engaging with people in anthropology and sociology, for example. It's offset some of the work that we've done uh, in, in, in geography. Um, so just a quick summary, really, of, of, of the programme again. It's core modules total 150 credits, and you can then take an, an additional optional uh, module worth 30 uh, credits from uh, another department. I've mentioned earlier that that includes uh, anthropology, psychology, sociology, and the School of, of, of Applied Social Sciences. Um, Sarah also mentioned earlier the Durham Research Method Centre. I just wanted to mention this is a recent innovation that the university has established. Um, as Sarah mentioned, this is a centre, uh, <clears throat> an interdisciplinary centre in the university that brings together research methods, expertise really from right across the entire uh, university. And all through the year, they put on a series of different uh, methods courses that are focused primarily uh, on postgraduate students, but in, in some cases staff actually follow some of these modules as well. So they put on a series of, of courses and workshops about all sorts of different issues to do with research methods or ethics and, and so on. Um, and if you know there are courses that you'd like to do that aren't available um, within the DRMC program, they, they do actually offer some bespoke uh, training. So if there's a particular sort of software package that you'd like to, uh, to, to get up to speed with or, or, or more familiar with, then uh, we can work with the DRMC to tailor some of the training that's available to you uh, in the department. And I think just a real sort of selling point really off the marm is this opportunity to develop your, your research dissertation. As I mentioned earlier, from about April onwards, you can choose any topic that you want to work on. Um, There'll be a, a discussion with myself as the programme director initially to sort of see what your ideas might be. But then the project is supported by uh, two academic staff that work with you then to sort of develop the idea. And there's a freedom really from about April all the way through to the end of the programme in September to just focus on your, your research dissertation, really to apply many of the things that you've learned about philosophical approaches or, or some of the different research methods that are involved or how you might go about sort of confronting ethical issues or questions of uh, dissemination. And just one final slide, if I can, just to sort of wrap up, really. I just wanted to uh, just uh, again emphasise some of the points that Sarah and Dave have made about, you know, how vibrant a social community um, we have for our postgraduates at Durham. There's a really excellent and really diverse and very international uh, postgraduate community in the department and, and as mom students you know you'd have an opportunity to engage with a whole variety of different social events as Sarah mentioned some of those have been sort of temporarily paused at the moment with with the COVID situation but we I just think it's one of the real sort of strengths of what we do as a department is a really great sort of uh, and, and closely integrated um, community of postgraduates in, and I think you, you, you know you you'd feel very much a part of that and would get a lot from being part of that as well in terms of all the different social interactions and the opportunities to mix with, with students from all over the world really. We have students from all kinds of different, di different regions around the world. So um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. So maybe I should um, hand back to, to Sarah at this point. Thanks, Marcus. Are there any questions coming through for Marcus specifically about the MARM programme? We did sort of expect that most of you would be our risk uh, cohorts coming through with the bigger programme. No questions at the moment for that? Okay, so we'll get on to the the, the, the bigger talk programme then, the, the risk master's programme, and we're going to hand over to Isabella to take it away. Can you see my screen at all? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm Isabella Bovalo, and I'm assistant professor in the Department of Geography, and I also um, am a current, current Risk Masters program director. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite interdisciplinary, but I mainly teach on the hydrology and climate courses. So I'd like to give you a bit of an introduction to the Risk Masters, um, but also this is really an opportunity for you to ask questions. So we'll have some time after, after the presentation for you to do that. 
Um, as I said previously, we do have two ri current risk master students with us today. We have Emily and Lucy, um, and they're both, you know, we've got both the MSc and the MA represented here. So please do take advantage of, you know, their being here. Do ask questions, find out what it's like to be at Durham, because obviously it's hard to visit at the moment. And I'll give them some time to speak at the end. So I know one of the uh, in the most the biggest uncertainties at the moment is related to the COVID-19 issues. Um, so it's obviously caused a huge amount of uncertainty everywhere. But I do want to reassure you uh, that, you know, we are we are planning to be open again, as Sarah says, um, and we will be running the course in on October. There are obvious uncertainties related to whether we will be able to offer you a full residential model or not. Um, again, related to some of the issues Sarah said earlier, whether you know whether social distancing is in place or not. But we are assuming that we will open in October, and even if we can't, um, we will be offering um, an online version of the course until it is possible for us all to meet together. Um, and I know international students uh, in particular would be very concerned about um, international travel, uh, whether you know there's individual country lockdowns or having to get visas at the last moment or anything. So even if international travel is restricted or is not possible, we still hope to be able to um, offer you as good a student experience as possible online uh, so that you are able to carry on and keep up with the course uh, until such time as it's possible to travel. So in the end, as uh, Sarah says, it might be a bit of a, a mixed kind of approach to start with about, you know, in-person teaching or online offering. But whichever way the course is delivered, we'll try and make this as fully accessible and as, with as much integration as possible as we, you know, uh, to kind of aim towards that, as much normality as we can. Um, and I do want to reassure you that if you, uh, you know, do some of this course online because of social distancing measures or whatever, um, or if you can't come immediately to, to Durham because of restrictions that, you know, even if you, if you you will be carrying out the course as much as possible as normal um, and you will obviously take away a very good degree from um, from Durham on that. So um, I want to start a little, with a little bit of background to the Risk Masters. Um, the course was set up in 2010 along with the Institute for Hazard Risk and Resilience, also known as IHRR. And IHRR is a world leading research institute um, supporting research and training uh, for the use in policy and practice. And it collaborates a lot with communities, NGOs and governments. So um, I think the association with IHRR is one of the key strengths of the course. Um, it, you know, it, the, the course itself benefits from a lot of interaction and support from the Institute. For example, we hold a careers and risk event every year for the students. Um, they support that and they also interact a lot with our uh, Risk Frontiers program, uh, where we invite leading scholars to Durham um, and they also organise lots of other events which the Risk Master students are, are invited to as well. And I think the other strength of the Risk Masters is that it sits within the Geography Department. So it's therefore quite interdisciplinary um, and it, you know, it tackles risk from both a human and physical geography perspective. The course itself is very successful. We have a good international student cohort normally. As Sarah said, we have you know, normally between 20, 25 to 40 students at times. And the international student numbers vary, uh, but I think you know, they bring a really good richness to the course. Many have worked before or many come from different experiences. And I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, a lot of the students all learn a lot from each other. So um, we offer both an MA in risk and an MSc in risk. Uh, the MSc in risk um, offers specialised training in physical hazards that pose risks to communities, and it really draws on the scientific understanding of risk. So it's really particularly uh, for students who are interested in engaging with understanding and quantifying environmental hazards. Um, so it covers topics such as flooding, earthquakes, landslides, fires, drought, um, and it has more of a practical element to it. The MA, on the other hand, explores more the social dimensions of risk and resilience. Um, it is aimed at developing risk through multiple epistemologies that cut across science and social science perspectives. And perhaps here in more risk is more um, objective and it's a more of a social and political construct um, and it draws on um, maybe more of the social dimensions of man-made disasters such as you know failures in communication infrastructure war terrorism security geopolitics financial risk environmental disasters and obviously pandemics would be in there as well both courses require um, 180 credits 
Um, there's two core modules which are shared between the MA and the MSc. So the first one is understanding risk, and that really gives you the foundation of risk from a multidisciplinary perspective. And then we have the risk frontiers, and that's the module which is um, organised with the IHRR Institute, which is a lecture based module with a selection of speakers from internal to and externally to the university. Then we have some modules uh, which are specific to each strand. For the MA, we have uh, using uh, geographical skills and techniques, which is also shared with the MARM programme, and then social dimensions of risk and resilience. And for the MSc, we have um, risk science and communication, and then either spatial and temporal dimension of hazards or hydrometeorological hazards. Then you have also the option to select um, another 30 credits, and then we have 60 credits given over to the dissertation. We have um, a very we offer a very flexible route through the risk masters uh, with three main pathways, although there are other options. Um, for the MA, we have a pathway in security and politics, and for this pathway, there are actually elective modules that you can take from outside the department, one of which is offered from the School of Applied Social Sciences, that's the Social Policy and Society module, and the other three, there's three modules from the School of Government and International Affairs, and those are um, from, you know, uh, it's gear we call it and it's one of the um, you know one of the best departments of politics and international relations in Europe and they offer really regional specialisms in um, disciplines there. Both the um, MA and the MSc offer pathways in either environmental hazards which is more of a physical and applied approach or um, climate risk and society which is more of an interdisciplinary approach which with cross-cutting themes across the two disciplines. So we have various ways of teaching normally. These include lectures, seminars, tutorials, workshops and computer practicals. And obviously, if we can't teach face to face, um, these might be adapted for online delivery. And it's more likely that the lectures themselves may be pre-recorded for you to go through at your own time and that we will have um, live question and answer sessions and discussion session sessions um, will be arranged to answer any questions on those. Um, the online delivery may also make use of discussion boards, for example, as well as live tutorials and small group sessions. Computer practicals, if they're online, will have um, tutorials and help sessions associated with them. And I should mention also that we have a software available uh, through the university so that you can run any software on your own computer through something which we call Apps Anywhere. Um, for the assessment, uh, we have formative assessment. Um, and these are, if you like, mock assessments where you receive feedback on your work. Um, they don't count towards your final marks, but they're usually structured to help you with your summative assessments, which do count towards your final marks. Um, again, these can take a variety of formats. Um, there are no exams as such, but there are things like a take home exam, which is an open book exam, uh, which takes place over a week or so. And there is various support available for you um, as you go through your course. There are academic advisors for you uh, if you have any particular issues. Um, and the staff are very open and approachable and they can help you with course related matters. Um, and we also have a very excellent support staff for helping if, if you've got any other issues, uh, health or welfare issues, they can help you with that. And finally, um, I think the, the Risk Masters is a very good community of students and uh, they're always happy to help you know, each other out on that. The dissertation, I think, is, is a very important part of the master's course. It's worth 60 credits. So therefore, a third of your mark. Um, and we offer two ways to go uh, to get your dissertation completed. Um, the first is dissertation by research. And this is more of a traditional way of doing your dissertation. So you pick individually a topic of your choice on hazard risk and resilience. And you work on this independently supported by uh, your research dis dissertation supervisor. Uh, the other way to do it, um, your dissertation, is to do a vocational dissertation with a partner organisation. And here students work with an organisation, again, supported by uh, a university dissertation supervisor. But the research here is more applied and of particular relevance to the, to the organisation you work with. Um, the dissertations vary enormously in topics um, and they're also very different in their level of flexibility. The students are responsible for finding an organisation to work with and I can help you um, sort that out. But we actually do offer some vocational projects ourselves through our contacts and through those of the IHRR Institute. And in the past, we've had organisations working with students um, such as the Environment Agency, various Rivers Trusts. We've had Newcastle City Council, Darlington Fire and Rescue Service, Arup, various 
you know, consultancies, environmental consultancies, catastrophe modeling companies such as Marsh, um, insurance companies such as Liberty and other private organizations. Um, I think one of the strengths is, is of the vocational dissertation program is, uh, you know, many of our risk master students, when they finish the course and get employment elsewhere, they actually come back to Durham and say, can I work with a student um, on a vocational dissertation? And so um, there's a really good community there. Um, some companies also recruit students through that vocational dissertation um, uh, kind of uh, process. So it's very good for, for job prospects. So in terms of employability, uh, the graduates from risk masters enjoy huge success in entering the job market um, in very many different disciplines here. And you can see some of the type of general um, posts and, and jobs they go into and they're recruited into. And of course, you also have uh, the opportunity to go into further research, such as a PhD, if, if you wish, after this. Um, so I can stop here and ask for questions. Um, if I have forgotten to say anything or if you find afterwards you've you know, got some other questions, feel free to email me. My email address is on there. Um, and perhaps I'll stop sharing my screen now and we can ask maybe uh, before, while you're thinking of questions, um, you know, whether you want to ask them live or, um, or on the chat function, that's fine. But I might perhaps pass over to um, Emily and Lucy, maybe to say a few words about what it's like uh, from their perspective on the um, risk masters. Um, I can stop sharing my screen. Um, <laughs> how do we do that? Um, you just press it on the central bar. Oh, there we go. OK. <laughs> so, Emily, um, Lucy, would you like to say a couple of words, maybe? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, um, so I'm on the um, MA in risk and I really enjoyed this year. I think probably one of my favourite aspects of the course is how it's been really supported and encouraged to within the course content um like pursue our own individual areas of research so throughout the course although i've been on the ma side i've been looking um at technology so i in my essays i've done i've looked at smart cities um facial recognition biometrics um early warning systems and climate management and how um technologies are used in climate insurance and so although i've been doing all these different modules and different like we've learned all this different stuff I've been able to like create a theme that throughout I've been able to pursue like my own areas of interest and it's been really supported and encouraged by all of the lecturers so yeah it's just made it really enjoyable and it's also a nice opportunity to test out um, ideas for them to use in your dissertation so now I'm using one of these things to now pursue a bit more in depth so yeah I think that's been one of my highlights um, of the course. But Emily, <laughs> thank you, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd also just like to add that um, I mean, I know not all postgraduate courses are particularly like sociable. I have friends who are doing masters at other universities and they're they're kind of feeling a bit isolated almost. But um, the risk course is actually really, really good for that because maybe because there are so many of us, but um, we have the manly room, which is like the room of dreams it's where pizza friday happens every fortnight and there's also coffee there every day so if you're working in a library you can just pop across to the manly room grab your coffee have a chat with people it's really really nice and um lucy and i are also the social secretaries for the course so we've had a couple of bar crawls which have been really nice and just like everyone's been so enthusiastic and everyone's got to know each other really well um, and there was also a risk breakfast as well, which um, Isabella organised for us. And um, the staff were sort of involved with that as well. So it's really nice. It's, it's a really nice way of getting the students and the staff to kind of interact, because even though the geography department is so massive at Durham, you do feel like more of an individual than like compared with undergrad level. Um, yeah, in terms of COVID, I know the um, Manly Room is actually happening virtually as well. So I think it will probably be the same as it was this year for getting to know people. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I see there is a question actually um, regarding uh, whether there um, there are there is any summative coursework and whether there are any summer exams. Um, so there is summative coursework um, and there is no exam as such uh, over the summer, but over the summer, that's the time 
when uh, you actually will be carrying out your dissertation. So we, from around May or June or so until you hand in your dissertation um, in early September, that's when you will be doing the majority of the work on your dissertation. And it's a fairly flexible program, so you can, you know, uh, make use of the university facilities or carry out your dissertation wherever you may be, um, depending on what, what if it's a vocational one or a um, or a research based one, you can, can carry that out uh, wherever you are. Yeah, there's also um, there is um, a piece of coursework which is called um, like the three week exam and it's called a take home exam. But basically at the beginning you get um, a list of questions and then over three weeks you have um, the other three weeks to answer three questions. So although it's like framed as an exam, it's just like a piece of coursework, but which is more time bound. Um, but it's not really like exam. But yeah. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions, either in person or on the chat? There's a question for Lucy. What are you doing your dissertation on and how do you find it? <laughs> um, so I'm currently <laughs> doing my dissertation on um, the use of facial recognition um, across the UK. So, um, yeah, I, I chose to do it because I did a summative on it earlier in the year in January and I found it like really interesting. Um, and it's an idea that I picked up from one of the, it was a tiny bit of one of the lectures that I decided to look at more. Um, so I've done a couple of interviews um, and a questionnaire. And then I'm also using like um, documents online as well to um, contribute other bits of research. But yeah, it's really good. And although it's remote, um, I have two disk supervisors and they're both really helpful. Um, and we have a call probably once a week and just so I can run my ideas by them and it's, it, makes you feel like you're basically there in person. It's the same as if you go in and have a meeting with them. Um, but yeah, really supported and yeah, really interesting. And my supervisors are also really like knowledgeable in that area as well. So it makes it feel like it's actually quite important, like the stuff you're doing because they really value, value it as well. So yeah. That's great, Lucy, thanks. Emily, should we hear from you about your dissertation? So have this, that's yeah, sides of my, the... my dissertation, um, I'm on the MSc side of the course, I should have said earlier, but it's completely different from Lucy's. So mine is about identifying the response of uh, beech trees to drought conditions in Bavaria. So um, I actually went to my supervisor and said, this is what I'm interested in, but I don't really have a study site. I'm, I'm not sure on specifics. And he said, oh, perfect. I'm actually doing a project in Bavaria. And he's got a colleague at Stirling University who has managed to purchase this really high resolution data that would have been really expensive and impossible for me to get otherwise. So I have now managed to get access to that, which is basically the equivalent of ground truthing all of my research um, if COVID hadn't happened and I would have been able to go out to Germany. So it's really good. Yeah, I've also got like a weekly catch up. But for me, it's more sort of troubleshooting technical issues, I would say, because um, prior to my dissertation, I could use ArcGIS, but I'm actually learning how to program for this. So I'm using Google Earth Engine and also a, pro a program called R which is new for me and yeah, I'm finding it really good. That's great, thank you. Um, please cool. do feel free to ask more questions online or in person, but um, since we're waiting for a couple of questions, I also wondered whether um, both of you might be able to say a little bit more about how you found the teaching um, at the end of term, because I know there was, um, obviously there was a COVID pandemic happening and we, we were restricted to our homes, but teaching was continuing. So you've had a little bit of an introduction how it might be online. I wonder if you could say a little bit about your experience there. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you go first. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, I've had a couple of um, group Zoom calls, which initially was a bit weird, but actually once everyone had warmed up, it was completely fine and it wasn't too awkward as well. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a, a good opportunity to engage in times when maybe we wouldn't um, like be able to that like, actually speak to our lecturers. Um, yeah, and it, I mean to me, it has, hasn't really made a difference, like compared to being in Durham or not. It, it felt very similar to sitting in a classroom and also because the course the, the class size is so small that actually it like it still seems quite intimate even though it's like over a zoom call or a skype call because there's only five of you anyway you all just 
you just all talk as you would in person anyway but yeah yeah I totally agree with that probably the most sort of um, weird thing we had was we had summative presentations for the climate risk society module at the end of last term so that was like the first big thing that was over video and it was also really stressful because it was summatively assessed but it actually went really really well everyone was sitting there you could kind of have a cup of tea on the side as well and I don't think anyone suffered as a result of it at all to be honest I preferred doing it online than doing it in person <laughs> <laughs> that's great thank you very much okay um we have a question for Mark Question, a question from Georgios, uh, who's an applicant for the MARM programme. Um, oh, a long question here. So it was mentioned many students choose to follow an academic career after the MA. Um, this is not Georgios' plans. Is this considered a good choice for a master's if you're not going on to the PhD? Um, Marcus, are you there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, and, and just to say that we do get lots of students that do the MARM programme and then go on to to do a PhD. Not, not by, by all means, it's not all students that do that. I would say it's about sort of 60, 70 percent of our students go on to do a, a PhD. So it's a good choice. But there are other pathways that people follow. So we've had students that have gone on to work for, for in, in, in the government sector that have gone on to work uh, for aid or humanitarian organisations in diplomacy and all sorts of uh, different fields but um, so you certainly wouldn't be at any disadvantage if you chose not to go on to do a PhD but um, but I think that's one of the real benefits of the MARM is that it does give you a chance it gives you a year really to work with a member of staff in the department or, 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 or more than one member of staff really to uh, develop some ideas and to think about what kinds of research you might want to take forward if you if you did want to uh, to do a PhD and um, just also, I just wanted to mention the funding question as well. I know that many of you will be thinking about sort of funding postgraduate work. And I just wanted to say that if anyone is considering doing the MARM or any other master's programme, really, and you're not sure about funding, just to get in touch with us, really, because we we know of different sources that are available. We can work with you to support to support you with that process. We realise that funding is a, is a critical component of, of doing a postgraduate um, degree programme. So... So yeah, if there's any questions about that, please do get in touch and it might be that we can help you to identify um, you know, possible sources that you might not have thought about. Uh, and certainly with the, with the application process generally, we can, we can help you with that too if you need any help along the way. Thanks, Marcus. I think just to reinforce that, I, uh, part of the reason there are so many people going on to do a PhD is because that master's does get funding. Um, our, our own... Uh, funding council funds people to do the masters and then go on to the PhD which is why you end up with quite a, a, a big pool there but it is a masters that stands alone in its own right people are registered for that not for a PhD and of course you know some people don't go on to do the PhD even if they think they're going to so so it is a, it is a training in research skills George so I hope that I hope that helps you there we have another question for Lucy um yeah. I've just seen that one whether your elective module was and how you found doing a module from a different school so um, initially I was going to do um, one of the modules from the different departments but actually I then decided to do the climate risk and society one um, which kept it all within like the geography department. I think it was partly because I'd done geography as my undergrad as well in Durham so it was a bit of safety just to stay in geography um, and although I'm more interested obviously like from the human side and like the social stuff the um, the climate module was did definitely have social elements and I didn't feel like out of place and um the two other girls or three other girls from the MA course also did the um the climate module as well but um I mean the, the module options do also sound really interesting so I wouldn't I wouldn't not choose to do it from a different school for like any reason that it's in a different school um but I did notice I think that um they were 100% summative on one essay, I think was a factor which maybe made me choose um, the climate risk module because I prefer to have um, like my summatives in like maybe chunks rather than all in one essay just because it's a bit of a big gamble. <laughs> um, but I mean, I'm sure they're really interesting um, and I'm sure you'd be able to get in touch with someone in that department if you had any questions about um, that module. 
yeah. Thanks, Susie. I, I think um, is that okay, Bex? I think I think it's probably important to emphasise it is a pretty interdisciplinary degree, although it's run out of geography. I think it's probably true, isn't it? But it's not only geographers that come on it. Um, it's a very it is seen as an interdisciplinary degree that you know, it covers the MSc, it covers the MA. You know, so that's why we have the options on other courses as well. So that's, that's one of its strengths, I think, Bex, if that helps. Um, Marcus, can I just quickly ask you if you can if you can put in the group chat an email to Georgios in response to his question there? He, he said, could he have an email address for? I'm literally. Yeah, yeah, I'm literally. I'm literally yeah, literally type it in that into the meeting chat. You can yeah. do, you, you can yeah. do that. Question okay. from Max. Um, do many MA risk students undertake vocational dissertation, or is that more often an MSc student option there? Okay, so um, I reckon we have around maybe a third of the students taking vocational dissertations. It does vary a little bit by, per year. And to be honest, I think there's a fair mix between MSc and MA students doing that. Um, so it really does align with whatever um, interests you have and whichever organisations uh, you either opt to uh, choose, you know, one of the existing ones we offer or whether, um, you know, you go off and find an organisation to work with yourself. But um, I think it's a fair mix between both, depending on your interests. That okay. Have we got any more questions or? Any other queries? Maybe um, while we're waiting for some more questions, uh, maybe. Um, Emily, uh, Lucy, maybe you can say a little bit what it's about, what it's like to be in Durham as a city rather than university, maybe, because I know people can't visit uh, Durham <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, I really like Durham. It's um, it's a city, but it's very small. It's got quite an intimate feel. I think it's a really nice cross between a campus university and a city university for that reason. So, I mean, you walk from the science site and about 10 minutes later you're right in the middle of town so it's really good for accommodation as well like wherever you end up living in Durham you're never going to be more than sort of a 20 minute walk away from where you need to be for lectures and things um yeah you can also just go for really nice walks at the weekend and things like if you if you walk 10 minutes in basically any direction then you're right in the middle of the countryside but also you can get a train to Newcastle and then you're right in the middle of like one of the biggest cities in the UK and you can do lots of exciting things there and it's a really cheap train ticket. It takes about 15 minutes. So, yeah, I really like Durham. I've not got bored of it after being there for four years. Yeah, also because of its size, it makes it you feel like you're actually part of a city rather than compared to maybe like London. You just feel like a small fish in a very 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 big pond whereas like in Durham it, you, it actually does like feel like home it like it because of its size and also I mean um obviously depending on how things go but um there's lots of like you're in you end up in colleges and um like it's really easy to get involved in sport and stuff as well which I think is a massive draw to being in Durham in general um I know lots of people um on the risk course that have got involved in sport through their colleges as well like football and everything so hopefully um if everything lifts that's for me was a massive factor that anyone at any ability can get involved in sport um so yeah that non-academic point <laughs> thank you Any last, any last thoughts? Any last questions? Do do feel you can get in touch with with any of us after the webinar if something you know, you know what happens. You ring off and you think, oh, trash, I meant to ask about such and such. A, um, don't hesitate to get in touch. We you know we want to hear from you. We want to allay any um, concerns. And actually, you know, you may have queries we haven't thought about in these slightly odd times as well. So do do um, do get in touch.
like if, if there's not anything else, they're like, oh, here we go, here we go, back to the normal backs. What are your plans when you finish your course, Emily and Lucy? This is heading your way. Um, so I've got um, a job lined up at IBM, which starts in August, um, where I'm going to be a business consultant for cloud technology. So really I've pursued this tech thing quite far now. <laughs> um, but yeah, and no, I'm really excited. Um, I did the application in the autumn for lots of grad schemes and it happened to be the one I got. Um, so yeah, I think it definitely having the um, MA and risk to speak about um, at the interview interviews, like it made me feel like I had something a bit extra maybe to talk about. And also because the course is so interesting, you like that the interviewer was also really interested as well in what we were learning um, and as I said the the content of the course is so diverse it's really can be applied to so many different jobs and stuff um, so yeah it made it feel like what I was learning was really relevant um, to yeah to talk about in interviews. I was going to say that Lucy's got a much more concrete answer than I do because I wasn't really sure when I started the course what I wanted to do afterwards. So I ended up not really applying for anything. And um, I've been applying for things recently, like very recently. Um, but my plan is mostly just to finish the dissertation and then apply for things after that. Um, I'm probably going to be applying for things in consultancy but I know people who are doing insurance things as well, um, people working or going into the civil service or thinking about it. Um, like like Lucy said, on the MSc as well, it's a really wide range of things that you can go into because of the skill sets that you develop. Um, so, I mean, it was pretty intense um, the, the, because, I mean, talking about grad schemes, quite a lot of the um, applications start in October time, um, but luckily it managed to correspond when you're doing um, more formative work and stuff. So I think that definitely fell at the right sort of time, but it's definitely, definitely manageable. Um, and also my lecturers were... Um, really supportive as well so I went and had a meeting with one of my lecturers about before my final IBM interview and she helped me learn about the cloud and stuff like that so like all the everyone all the lecturers and all all the our peers and stuff are so supportive of everyone doing applications everyone's kind of in the same boat so yeah it was really nice and it's definitely manageable um to do alongside you just got to manage your time um a bit better but yeah definitely focus on doing them in the autumn when you've got a bit more time because I definitely think the course is slightly more intense in the second term and the work is summative and you're starting to think about your dissertation and stuff. Um, I think on that note though the deadlines for the course are really nicely spaced out throughout the year because I remember undergrad it felt like at times there were sort of massive clusters of deadlines and the stress was definitely higher but um, even though things in first term are formative it's all really nicely spread. I think we had one tiny cluster where we had about two or three things due in the same week, but I didn't feel stressed up in the lead to it because we had enough enough time without deadlines before it to kind of um, do things properly. And yeah, it's kind of been, it's been a very steady workload throughout the year rather than all at once, which I've really liked. Yeah, and because the classes are so small, um, when you have, like formatives or summatives if you've got any queries it's really easy to either discuss with your peers because you're like good friends with them or it's easy just to bring up it's not like you're asking a question in front of loads of people it's really easy to um yeah like discuss in class and also I found that the lecturers have like promoted discussions on like talking about what we're going to do our formatives and summatives on which definitely actually really helps doing um the assessments Great, thanks very much. <clears throat> I think some of the points that, that, that um, Emily and Lucy have been making uh, would apply also to, to the MARM in many ways. It's, you know, it is also an interdisciplinary course. We hope that you know, we do try to kind of timetable and space out the, 
the the assignments and it is you know it's a small community that really gets to know one another and and you know you feel a little bit more comfortable voicing tentative thoughts and so forth um, than perhaps in a big class so i think that applies about, about along across the across the piece okay i think if there's if there's no more pressing questions at the moment we'll maybe call time and and say uh, warm thanks to Emily and Lucy for joining us today and thank you all very much for, for your interest in the course uh, and as I say do get in touch if you've any more questions at all before before October or indeed if you're thinking uh, further down the line to 2021 and uh, well we hope to look, look, we look forward to seeing you uh, either in person or on screen in October. Thanks very much. Thank you everybody, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.